If you hated every single one of these books, it is your right to be wrong. Well, then you better not come and tell me that you like A Song of Ice and Fire. And I cried like a baby. <laughs> these are the good ones. Congratulations, I feel betrayed. <laughs> Books that are worth the hype. This video might equally be called books that I have special editions of because of the books I'm gonna show you, there's only two that are not special editions. And of those two, one of them is a first edition. So it's basically a special edition. So yeah, this is part two of two. The first part was books that I felt are not worth the hype, but we're ending on a high note with books that I think are worth the hype as just like with the ones that are not worth the hype, this is my opinion. If you hated every single one of these books, it is your right to be wrong. Without further ado, these are the good ones. Let's start out with some obvious ones. Um, so The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. I love The Name of the Wind. I have basically an entire shelf of books that are for the Kingkiller Chronicle, even though there's only like two and a half books published. <laughs> Think that's excessive? Well, it's my life. You don't have to live it. Uh, Name of the Wind I read long before I ever joined booktube. Um, I discovered it all on my own. Just found it in a bookstore in a little corner. Just a mass market paperback. I was like, hmm, this seems like something that I could read on my commute and um, missed my stop nearly every day that I was reading it on the bus. This book has remained one of my all-time favorites. Patrick Rothfuss's prose, mm, chef's kiss, gorgeous. 10 out of 10, no notes, just fantastic. Wise Men's Fear slight steps down, like in terms of the plot, but the prose still remains gorgeous. And I, you know, I'm not gonna say I don't care that we don't have book three in the Kingkiller Chronicle, because obviously I would like more, but if all we ever get is The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, I'm kind of fine with it because The Name of the Wind is just so gorgeous that just rereading this for the rest of my life is is pretty okay. <laughs> like better that than nothing. If my options were to never have the Kingkiller Chronicle or to only have it unfinished, like unfinished, I'll take it. Reasons people don't like this that are not just me being facetious and saying they're dumb and don't understand quality. <laughs> the main character is kind of a twat. That's kind of built into the narrative, like that's acknowledged in the narrative, so it doesn't really bother me. But if you really don't like the main character, well, he's the main character. It's not multi-POV, so you're gonna be in trouble. It's not heavy on plot. It's it's mostly a character driven like coming of age story as being told by the character themselves. And the world building is 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 very well done, but it's not like groundbreaking. It's, it's a pretty traditional fantasy world, but he's like fleshed it out really, really well and made it feel very lifelike and thought out all the details of it very well. So it feels like a living, breathing world that you kind of like step into when you read his beautiful prose. But if you, again, you don't like flowery prose, if you don't like more poetical prose, you're crazy. But also you probably won't like this because some people just literally don't like Patrick Rothfuss's prose, which is crazy to me. But again, it's your right. So um, if you haven't read The King Killer Chronicle, who cares it's not finished yet? Whatever. You read it anyway. It's, it, I promise you it's fine. I promise. Next up, I have Red Rising by Fierce Brown. Now, I until recently would have said, well, the Red Rising series is worth the hype, uh, not necessarily Red Rising itself. And I kind of still say that. My opinion of the first book has improved because we're doing a read along for in anticipation of the release of the new book this summer. So I did reread Red Rising recently and I did like it a lot better this third time through. So I do feel more kindly towards it. I gave it five stars this time, but I do still think that like it's the weakest entry in the series. And it's just kind of like a familiarity thing. Like I've read these books so many times that when I see these familiar characters, when they're just introduced, like I already know them from the next book. So like the fact that they're not that well fleshed out um, and not like you don't really get to know them that well in the first book but I already know them so it's like I, I'm just seeing familiar friends so to speak or at least familiar faces and I kind of like know what it is going in because I've read it before so I can take it on its own terms. The first book he like rage wrote it for himself at 23 like he didn't even really mean it to be like a book that would be a bestseller so he didn't really like properly start I don't want to say he wasn't like properly writing Red Rising because that's like disingenuous and not true but like in essence it's true and that's you know how it is oftentimes like you try so hard at something that you think is going to be successful or popular and no one wants it and then you kind of like say fuck it and just do whatever you want and then that's the thing that's like really popular or really well really well received so that's kind of what happened with Red Rising so like obviously like it was edited and, and gone through and everything so it's, it's not like it went from like his bedroom diary to the publisher is like obviously not but like it kind of reads like a young man kind of working through his own issues in a fiction book and the next books don't really feel that way so much but he does mature with the series um just because I mean he got older as he wrote it and um his writing craft got better and better and better with every book so I do think Red Rising like it's still a strong debut and the series just improves so much over time and it's very clear how much Pierce Brown himself really wants to improve, like he wants to stretch his wings and strive for more, strive for better, try to 
grow as a writer, not just kind of rest on his laurels, which is great to see. So I'm so excited for the new book to come out. And yeah, Red Rising is the bomb diggity. Like if you don't like the first one, I feel you. I didn't love it. Just just get through it and read Golden Sun. And if you still hate it, well then, okay, maybe you don't like Red Rising. But I didn't become a fan until I read Golden Sun. Stepping away from fantasy for a second, actually for two seconds, <laughs> of The Secret History by Donna Tartt, which is like the OG Dark Academia. And in my opinion, basically almost no other book has actually been Dark Academia since then. They keep claiming to be, they keep trying to be. But it's like every retelling of Wuthering Heights that just doesn't understand Wuthering Heights. Cause like Wuthering Heights is not supposed to be romantic, but people find that toxic story romantic. So then they write retellings of it that romanticize something that Emily Bronte was not romanticizing. Similarly, people find the darkness of the academia, this kind of like darkly romantic idea. So when people write their versions of this, they're writing it because they like this, and so they're romanticizing it, which is not what Donna Tartt was trying to do. Which is why one of the many, many reasons I think most dark academia books just are not good and certainly fail at being dark academia. So Donna Tartt did it first and Donna Tartt did it best. <laughs> this is a book about people being selfish, people being self-absorbed, people being narrow-minded, people being bigoted, and people just following obsession to the no good place that obsession leads. <laughs> and it's it's dark, it's interesting, it's pretentious, but the pretension is like, is a feature and not a bug. Because the characters themselves are kind of like destroyed by their own pretension. So I think it's just an absolute masterpiece. Her prose is incredible. It's just velvety and rich and decadent to read. So I kind of get why people get like swept up in the kind of like romance of this dark academia story. But like guys, <laughs> We're not supposed to aspire to this. That's not the point of this. But I do recommend reading it. Another not fantasy is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I'm kind of regretting choosing all my special editions for this video because they're very shiny and it's kind of tricky to navigate that while filming. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, I probably wouldn't have read if not for the hype. And usually when I pick up hyped books, I'm like, it can't be all that great. And nine times out of 10, I'm like, that was overhyped. Like it was fine, but like it wasn't that good. I don't think it was worth all that hype. Evelyn Hugo, I went in going like, I would never really want to read that. It's a like historical fiction lit fic book about an old Hollywood starlet. There's like zero percent interest for me in something like that, just like based on the description. But everybody and their mother, every genre reader was like, Evelyn Hugo is amazing. Fantasy readers, lit fig readers, mystery readers, everybody was like, Evelyn Hugo though. So I was like, all right, Evelyn Hugo though. Let's, let's find out. So I read it. And I cried like a baby. I was like, okay, you were right. You were all right. Evelyn Hugo is amazing. I think that Taylor Jenkins Reid's ability to like write this fictional story that feels so real. And not just in like, you know, well-written characters because they are very well-written characters. I mean, like this is like the life story of a supposed famous Hollywood actress. So the way that this feels like an authentic history where when I finished this book, I was like, now I want to go and rent all of these old Evelyn Hugo classic Hollywood films that were discussed here. Those famous scenes with the famous dress or whatever. And like none of that's real. She didn't exist. Like it's inspired by a lot of real Hollywood actresses, really real Hollywood films, but none of this existed, but it feels like it did the way she writes it, which is just so impressive to me. And then yeah, just the character story is really compelling. Like I said, I cried like a baby. <laughs> Even if this is not your kind of thing, I didn't think it would be my kind of thing. Maybe it won't be your kind of thing. I cannot guarantee it. But I'm just saying, it seems like this is like low-key everybody's cup of tea. I don't know how, but it is. <laughs> Back to fantasy. I next have The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch. So this is not a special edition, but this is a first edition. Um, so it's basically a special edition. <laughs> The Lies of Locke Lamora was another like commute book that I read long before booktube. I think I read it before Name of the Wind or after, but like around the same time. Cause I was just going to like the used bookstore and picking out mass market fantasy paperbacks based on their covers just to read on my commute. And there was a lot of hits and like these weren't like featured on shelves. I was just randomly picking them. So I'm just saying I had a sixth sense for classics, <laughs> for modern classics. The Lies of Locke Lamora is it's so good. This series also I think improves as it goes, but I do love the first book. Like I was blown away to begin with. And I just think that his writing craft improves, the humor improves, the characterization improves, everything does get better. Unlike King Killer Chronicle, the third book ends on a massive, I'm not sure cliffhanger is the right word. I guess cliffhanger. It's more of like a massive bombshell, like massively like world altering information is delivered to you at the end of that book. And then you're just like, bam, okay, bye. And you're like, wait, 
wait, you can't just tell me that and then just leave and then not write another book for years and years. So like, yeah, like that's not great. So you could just read Lives of Lachlan Moore as a standalone. It does work pretty well as a standalone if you're worried about being left hanging like that. But so this is a very sort of like Italian feeling world and it's about this sort of like heisty group. It's like Robin Hood meets Ocean's Eleven in Italy mixed with Oliver Twist. It's magical, it's immersive, it's lush. The city of Camor feels very Venetian. This like group of thieves that you follow, it's just such a like incredibly dynamic group with amazing humor and amazing character beats and just great chemistry. And we have these two timelines. So you see Little Lock Lamora, which is a very kind of like Oliver Twist um, feeling storyline. The present day where they're adults and they're they're combining forces to pull off elaborate heists, which are filled with tricks and double blinds. And again, the, the way the food is described, the way the city is described, the way the magic is described is just so lush that you like want to picture it and you want to be in that world. And the story keeps throwing out twists and bombshells and reveals at you. And it's quite a ride and it's an amazing ride. And I highly, highly recommend it. Speaking of heists, the book that constantly gets mentioned as a read-alike for Lies of Lac Lamora, which I don't think does either book any favors, but I do think it's worth the hype, is Six of Crows by Lee Barzugo. This is young adult, but it is quite mature for young adult. This likewise follows a band of thieves, criminals, uh, as they pull together to pull off a heist. But while heisting and the heist and the elaborateness of the heist is kind of like one of the major appeals of the Lies of Lac Lamora, Six of Crows, while there is at the heart of the story, a fairly elaborate heist. The book isn't really about that. Like the heist is like a reason to bring these characters together and to follow these characters and what's going on with them and their lives and their stories, which is interesting. And it is filled with twists and secrets and it's an engrossing plot. If you're coming to this book expecting like an extremely clever heist where the focus of the story is on the heist, you'll probably be disappointed. There is a heist, but it's very, it's much more character driven. Uh, like that's the point of this book. And I think that's done so, 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 so well. Kaz Brecker is my favorite. I love Kaz so much, but I also love the other characters as well. It's a great group dynamic. It's just so well done. It's so well done. It's so worth the hype. And even if you don't predominantly read YA, if, you, if you're like, I only read adult fantasy. Well, first of all, like get over yourself. But second of all, this is on the more mature side of YA. So, you know, give it a go. And if you're gonna tell me that, oh, I couldn't read Six of Crows because I just couldn't take it seriously that these characters are supposed to be 17 years old, like police. Well, then you better not come and tell me that you like A Song of Ice and Fire because Jon Snow is 14. So don't. Before we move on from YA, I have one more YA book to share with you, which is also much more on the mature side and could easily be sold as adult fantasy, in my opinion. And that is Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. Now this special edition cover looks extremely different from the normal cover. So just in case you don't recognize this and you don't know what I'm talking about, the way it normally looks is like this. Um, but Strange the Dreamer, it's a Lainey Taylor book, so it's pretty much impossible to explain what it's about because to tell you what it's about or what the majority of the plot is about is to spoil something that happens quite early on in the story. This is a big problem with Lainey Taylor books. What I can tell you is that her writing is lush and evocative, similar to Patrick Rothfuss. The first time I read Strange the Dreamer, when I read the first page, it was the first time in my life since reading Name of the Wind that I was like, oh, this is like Rothfuss. Like I hadn't experienced that since finishing Name of the Wind. And I was like, okay. Uh, the world, again, is like so evocatively described. The characters in this book are very emotionally described. Um, it is quite character driven. Uh, a somewhat important note about the kind of project of this book or this duology is that Lenny Taylor had written a trilogy before this, the Daughter of Spoken Bone trilogy, which has a lot of like war and battle and a lot of violence. And there's a lot of darkness in Strange the Dreamer. It's actually not that light a read, even though it's kind of, I mean, I kind of think of it as kind of fluffy and beautiful, but it has actually at its core a lot of darkness and trauma. But what I'm, the point I'm getting at is that Lenny Taylor, after writing a series that's very war-centric, wanted to write a series where war can't solve your problems, violence can't solve your problems. If that's not the answer, if that cannot be the answer, what do you do? So this isn't gonna ha be like battle centric. This isn't gonna be like that, but it's very interesting. The magic is very interesting. It's so well done. It's so, such an emotional read and I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Oh, but I do have to mention that the first and second and as many times as I've ever read it, <laughs> there's something that she does at the end which uh, is necessary for the story she eventually wanted to tell in the second book that made me feel betrayed as a reader. And most people don't feel this way. The only person that I know of 
that felt exactly the same way that I did is Hillary from Bookborn because I made her read this book and she was like, how could you do this to me? Um, and I was like, because I needed someone else to feel the way that I do at the end of this book. Betrayed. <laughs> and she was like, well, <laughs> congratulations, I feel betrayed. So just a quick warning about that. But it's still amazing. And I think Hillary would second that. Next up is the only book that's not a special or first edition. Um, although I do or I will eventually have a special edition because I did recently order like a mega super duper special edition of it. But I won't have that for some time. And there is a tragic lack in this department. You can't even get hardcovers. Um, and that is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin and the entire Broken Earth trilogy. But the fifth season of the three I think is like the whole thing as a project, the entire trilogy is a masterpiece. But the fifth season would I would say is my favorite of the three. This is not for the faint of heart. It's an extremely harrowing story. I guess it's sci fantasy. Um, it's unclear exactly where and when this is taking place. It seems kind of like a futuristic Earth. But again, it's very unclear where and when this is taking place. And it definitely has things in it that would be very difficult to explain as like sci-fi. It definitely feels more like magic, but it's hard to pin that down. So this is a, let's say a far future Earth, or it gives that feeling. And the, the very Earth itself has kind of become the enemy. The Earth itself is pretty unhospitable to life, uh, to human life in particular. And so we follow three characters as they navigate this world in very sort of different parts of the world, different parts of society, different parts of the kind of like social infrastructure. So you get eyes on kind of different ways human beings have reorganized themselves in order to respond to the world being the way that it is. And it's so insanely well done. First of all, the inventiveness of the world building in the story is amazing. But also the way that the culture and the people have responded to this is so authentically done. I often refer to it as being quite anthropologically done. This imagining of how humans would respond to not just the physical environmental threats, but how they would also turn on each other in such circumstances and how they would harm each other in those circumstances, but also how they would band together in those circumstances, how society would change, how culture would change, how so social and cultural norms would change, how social strata would change, how all of this would kind of like reform itself in response to the environment. Because if we're going to talk about anthropology, culture is as much a product of the environment that it is placed in as it is of like the minds of the people. It is often formed around culture, uh, biological and, and environmental necessity that then becomes a part of cultural practice as a response to that. So the way that she has invented this world and the people's response to it, I've never read anything like it before in my life. It is incredible. I am still gobsmacked about this book. Next up, I have The Assassin's Apprentice or just Assassin's Apprentice. I hate when people add the to titles that doesn't have the and I did it now myself by Robin Hobb. The Farseer trilogy is I have not yet finished Fits and the Fool. I'm like more than halfway through the last book in Fits and the Fool and then I'll be done with all of the Realm of the Elderlings. And I think I will still maintain that the Farseer trilogy, the original trilogy, is my favorite in the Realm of the Elderlings, which is not to say that the other books are not good. They are. But if I have to choose a favorite, I think it's still the original first trilogy, the Farseer trilogy. And the first installment is good, but it's not what sort of like blows me away. So a little bit like Red Rising, a little bit like Lies of Lac Lamora. The first book is probably the weakest installment, certainly in that trilogy, um, and it is a weaker installment in The Realm of the Elderlings, though I still love it to bits, and it is very cozy and engrossing and heartfelt and heartbreaking, but I do think that the second and third books in the Farseer trilogy are what kind of like shoot it to the moon as like mm, chef's kiss. 10 out of 10. It feels like a very cozy familiar fantasy world where it's, it's kind of like with Rothfuss where it's not that this world is like so crazy new fangled and um, groundbreaking in its invention. It's a very traditional feeling world. It's very cozy and familiar feeling. It's just that it's so well done. It's so like authentically realized. It feels like a living breathing world. There's a lot of little details about it's not just like oh we've got castle, we've got knights, we've got king, whatever. Don't need to be more specific than that. It's, she has thought through everything about this like fantasy culture so even though it feels familiar it's so thorough in its execution that it feels like this authentic real place that you could visit and has its own history and lore and people and culture and then the characters in it are so well written, heartbreakingly so most of the time. She does love to torture her characters, so FYI. There is also animal cruelty, which is extremely hard to read. I'm not gonna lie. It's one of the main reasons the series is so heartbreaking to read, so FYI on that as well. But it's so well done. So, so well done. Robin Hobb, next to 
Jabber Crombie and George R. R. Martin is like one of the absolute best in terms of world building and character building and like doing both at the same time. So yeah, I highly recommend. Second to last, I've got The Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee. Now I have not yet read Jade Legacy. Don't at me about this. I'm gonna read it. I am because I love Jade City and I loved Jade War. It is 1000% worth the hype. I was so nervous to read Jade City because a little bit like Evelyn Hugo, like I went into this having heard the hype. This wasn't like Name of the Wind where I just like randomly found it, no pressure, no expectations, and was wowed. Everyone on the fantasy bookish internet was losing their minds over the Greenbone Saga. So when I finally picked up Jade City, I was like, God, I hope I like this because I'm so tired of having the hot take that whatever it is that everyone loves, I hate. So when I started reading Jade City and was like, oh, I'm into this. I am very into this. I was simultaneously excited just to have a book that I'm enjoying and also relieved to not be hating it. <laughs> so this is again very different from what we normally get in fantasy. In some respects this is more like urban fantasy and yet it's urban fantasy as written by like a high fantasy author. So urban fantasy like I don't really like. <laughs> I never read it but I really love this and it's not just that oh this is urban fantasy done well. It's not written like urban fantasy. This feels like the way that like high fantasy is written usually but we've placed it in a modern setting. So if if Patrick Rothfuss had written Name of the Wind but had like made his world have like a more modern idea of technology and society which like is an option <laughs> and that's not really I don't think the approach when people write urban fantasy. Urban fantasy is like no let's take our actual real world and add some magic to it versus being like well in theory if all these fantasy worlds are like oh this is like medieval Europe this is like the renaissance like in theory if we kept telling stories in those worlds that if progress is made in technology etc that eventually they might come to look like something more like our modern world and still be this entirely fantasy world. So that's kind of what Greenbone feels like. So that's why I don't really feel like it's like urban fantasy and it doesn't have the tropes and trappings and like narrative expectations that anyone who reads urban fantasy would go in expecting. So it doesn't really belong with urban fantasy even though it's I guess urban fantasy. So anyway this feels like Peaky Blinders in magical modern-ish Asia-ish. So we've got these sort of like um, Yakuza-esque inspired clans that are very mafia in vibe although they are sanctioned by the government. The magic system is based on jade stone being used by people who have a sensitivity to it to increase their power and strength etc. And the way that she's built this world and all of the beliefs and practices and traditions surrounding the use of jade and the way these clans work and the really messy gray world she's painted where like the people you're rooting for you're like I don't know that I should be rooting for this because <laughs> like they are pretty violent and I don't know that this is the best way to organize your society but they are our main characters so I guess I'm rooting for it. <laughs> and then there's introduction of, of drug abuse and things like that that is again invented for the world and it doesn't feel like just a lazy analog of something in our real world while still being very like you you recognize some of the issues that we have in our real world but it doesn't just feel like what's the word for a story? <laughs> that's just telling a different story in a mask. Oh my gosh, there's a word for it. That's what Narnia is. Allegory. <laughs> it's not an allegory, but it's just so complex and it gets even more complex in Jade War. The characters themselves are well written, um, even if they're difficult to read about or difficult to root for. I love this to bits so much. It's so good. It was 100% worth the hype and I do want to read Jade Legacy, but also when I read Jade Legacy, then it'll be over. Although I do have the Jade Setter of Jan Loon as well, but then it'll be over. I'm not ready for it to be over, so I'll get there. I'll get there. And never fear, last but certainly not least is the Blade itself or the entirety of the first law by Joe Abercrombie. I don't know how much I really need to say because if you're here and you're at my channel then you probably already know that we stand first law on this channel. <laughs> it is like my entire personality. When I have completed every collection that I'm in the process of collecting for first law, so like these, this is the Broken Binding edition, Broken Binding is doing more books, so like when I have all of those and every other like series of editions that I'm like getting all of the editions for, once I have all of those I think I legitimately will have enough First Law books to fill an entire bookcase with just First Law books. <laughs> Which isn't why it's worth the hype, but I'm just saying. <laughs> so yeah, I love, 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 love the First Law. I didn't love it the first time I read it though. The first time I read The Blade itself, I had no idea that it was Grimdark. I didn't really even know that Grimdark Fantasy existed. I was a lot, lot younger. I picked it up expecting, you know, a hero and a quest and some wizards and whatnot, and I got Sandan Glockta. And I was like, what? <laughs> this, this is the protagonist? 
why, why would anyone want to read this? Why would anyone want to be reading about this? Who is rooting for this? I did some growing and some changing and some, some darkening and I returned to the world of the first law and was like, oh, okay, I get it now. This is my cup of tea. So if you're not one for violence, if you're not one for gallows humor, if you're not one for lots of politics and intrigue and lot, a very character driven story, that's not that focused on like a, a quick plot where like lots is happening or lots and lots of magic and world building. It's pretty stripped down in, in that sense, but it's very political and very complex from a character perspective. Again, very dark. Most of the characters are pretty like terrible people in one way or another. It's incredible the variety of terrible this on offer, <laughs> but it has excellent wit and humor. Again, mostly gallows humor, which is my favorite kind of humor. So these are my comfort reads. Sandan Glockta is my comfort character. So I love these books. They feel cozy to me to return to over and over and over again, even though it's admittedly dark and violent and gritty and I guess unpleasant, but I never feel that depressed by it. I've read Grimdark that's depressing. I never find First Law depressing. It's just darkly hilarious and at times tragic and at times emotional, but I mostly am grinning from ear to ear when I read First Law. <laughs> Maybe that says more about me than it does about anything else. If any of that sounds great to you, then what are you doing? Read First Law. And those are all the books. Well, I shouldn't say all the books. There are certainly other books that have been hyped that I have also enjoyed that are not here today on this list for whatever reason. So it is not an exhaustive list, but it is um a pretty good list, I think. <laughs> Let me know in the comments down below if you've read these already, if you've never read these, if I've convinced you to read them, if I've convinced you not to read them, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.